Okay, on to Chapter 5, Oversoul 7's Mini Vacation, page 36. Oversoul 7 kept making platforms to hold himself above the well of Maha's experience, only to topple down into it again. His apartness from her was slipping, and in those moments of his own lucidity, he thought that this wasn't fair at all. Cyprus was going too far. This part of the exam was too difficult for his stage of development. He'd fail miserably if he didn't end up losing himself in Maha completely, if that was possible. The only time he managed to reassert himself was when he was called on consciously or unconsciously by one of his other personalities, or when Maha needed him in some direct manner. For example, he was lost within Maha, or thought that he was, when suddenly he was aware of Proteus, his descent to earth. Quick, clear images came to him as Proteus landed. Once he saw the entire landscape from the tip of one of Proteus's skis. What on earth was he up to? Seven wondered irritably. And what was happening to Joseph and Lydia while he was trapped, what else could you call it, inside Maha's body? Maha, it seemed, needed his help at every turn. When he was Maha, losing his independence, then he felt her own fear and insecurity, unmitigated, without the benefit of his own superior knowledge and her fear threatened to devour him. He had to get her above it, he realized suddenly. Only her release would free them both. Actually, she was pretty aggressive and independent on her own, except when her fear made her forget everything that she knew, as it was, or as it had yesterday. Was it yesterday, when they'd been found? The men who captured them were different in appearance from any people that Maha or Rampa had ever seen, and it was this that frightened them so completely. Maha cried out as they were led down the hall beneath torches that were set in the wall niches. She and Rampa were terrified of fire, Seven discovered. Both of them cowered at the fire itself and at the dark shadows that leaped up the rocky gray walls. Their captors, or rescuers, were approximately, approximately nine feet tall, as Lydia would have measured them, to Maha's five foot three and Rampa's five foot eight. Besides this, the men wore robes dyed with brilliant colors and obviously not made of hides. Seven knew that he had some information concerning these people, but Maha's emotions kept blocking out his own awareness. In the cave now, Maha stared at the wall. She and Rampa were chattering, wondering whether or when they would be freed. They'd just finished eating the last of the roots they'd gathered and tied about their waists. A torch burned high above them. The top of the room was open in the center. The two of them were less frightened now. They'd been left alone for hours. The cave's door refused to budge, but otherwise they were not restrained in any way. Oversoul Seven let his own consciousness climb up again wearily, he peered through Maha's eyes, but as he did so, images appeared on the cave wall. They were apparent to him, but not to Maha, who paid no attention. Briefly, he thought that this was strange, since they were, after all, her eyes he was looking through. The pictures were milky and opaque at first, then they turned clear, soft, vivid, to seven but not to Maha. 
the wall disappeared as if it did not exist. Mentally, to no one in particular, Lydia had just called for help. The trailer wall was blurring before her eyes, and she knew what that meant. It was one of those trailer camper trucks Lawrence was driving. She'd been reading at the small table that was hinged to the half wall behind the driver's seat. One slim, bony hand still rested on the book. Now it trembled suddenly without warning. Another petite stroke. Quickly. She leaned back while she still could, anchoring herself so that she wouldn't fall off the chair and she wouldn't call Lawrence. She determined not to do so. Let him drive on unknowing. The edges of her vision were blurring faster now. Something within her was giving way. She braced herself for the confusion, maybe for unconsciousness. Would Lawrence have the guts to give her the pills? You promised, she thought wildly. I won't die senile in a home locked up. Her eyes flew to the small high cabinet where the pills were kept. If she didn't come out of it, right. If her mind was gone, if she couldn't keep up, Lawrence knew what to do. Looking at the cabinet was the last thing she remembered. As usual, when she came out of it, she didn't know what had happened. Lawrence was still driving and listening to the radio. Then she hadn't called out, or he hadn't heard if she had. The book was still beside her. She felt dizzy, that was all. She? But who was she? Panic splashed over the frightened surfaces of her mind. How could she forget? How could the body forget its name? The body's name? Did the body have a name? Oh, Lord. She closed her eyes, feeling as if tiny islands of knowledge were crumbling away, falling into endless oceans of oblivion. So quickly that he hardly realized what he was doing. Oversoul Seven leapt, leaped from Maha to Lydia's body. With all-knowing finesse, he quickened her blood, thinned it, gave orders to the body consciousness to increase circulation, filled in with the commands necessary. Count, Lydia, remember, remember, count, he directed. She suddenly recalled a trick that sometimes worked. Quickly, she found the name for the first number, one. She saw it in her mind and concentrated on it visually. Then two, then three, continuing in order until finally the panic cleared and her own name, Lydia, floated back to her between 15 and 16. Oversoul Seven returned, again without knowing how he did so to Maha. He thought triumphantly. He wasn't trapped inside Maha for good. He'd left, if only momentarily. Still, his distance from his personalities was vanishing. He must have agreed. No experience was ever thrust upon a soul, or a personality for that matter. But when had he agreed? And what else had he agreed to? Seven felt petulant. Already Maha was getting restless again. What was she up so what was she so upset for? Lydia could have lost her life right then, and he knew she wasn't ready. The thought intrigued him. If she wasn't ready, then she wouldn't lose it, of course. Actually, Lydia was thinking the same thing. Here she was, the attack was over, she was alive. And as far as she could tell, she was still sane enough. She forced herself to concentrate on Lawrence and away from herself. How close he was, yet how far away. She watched the back of his head like a big bleached walnut, she thought. The brown-white hair so alive, so bristly. The cords on the back of his neck so responsive. Oh, the ease with which his neck shifted as he watched the road. You're awfully quiet back there, Lawrence said cheerfully. 
Am I? Her first spoken words after the attack were so bright, her voice so crystal clear and lovely and sane and normal, that she wanted to shout out with joy. Oh God, how great life consciousness was. It's such a great day. A shame to read and not pay attention, she said. So I've been looking out the window. Well, we'll we will stop soon for supper, he said. Hmm. She opened her pocketbook, looked into the compact mirror. Her face was intact. How odd. The eyes flecked with orange, looked clear, alert, knowing, sardonic as usual. The face wasn't even terribly wrinkled for seventy-three. She was too thin to get wrinkled, she supposed. The mouth small, drawn down at the corners now, though. The thick white bubble of hair, still vigorous. Yet, what happened in those, what, three minutes? Not enough blood to the brain, as the doctor described it. And unnoticed, the small cells die, one by one, blinking off, taking memory and desire with them. What events had disappeared that she would no longer recall? What fine discriminations necessary to ordinary life had vanished? How many did you have to lose before it showed? Pity, the poor body, the poor mind, so thoughtlessly losing its precious cargo. Shit, she snapped to herself. That kind of thinking was worse than, well, maybe even a stroke itself. It bled. The will dry. Live in the moment, she looked out, filling her mind with the view. It was autumn. Why had fall always made her feel exhilarated? Yet it did. They passed brown-gray lawns and others that were deep in orange fallen leaves, and soon they were driving through a small town. There were all the houses, she thought, and each was secret and mysterious, containing within dimensions of human experience that could never be put into words. Would words finally desert her, too? They would, she supposed. Yet, here she was, seventy-three, traveling through those towns and villages in this today. Suddenly she laughed. All at once it seemed that the houses and trees were all artificial in some way. She couldn't put her finger on it. That the leaves would somehow be recycled and used again. And no one would know the difference except maybe a very few children, perhaps. Yet a great nostalgia filled her at the same time, as if the whole town had already gone beyond recall, or as if she had left it in some way she couldn't understand. Simultaneously, a sheer rush of love for the real physical world filled her. This was real earth, after all, and she was still in it, still rational and alive in it, she felt exultant. These lovely Ohio towns, she said. It's Proteus. It's Proteus's memory of the Ohio block and its artificial foliage that just struck Lydia in bleed-through fashion. And it's Proteus's fresh astonishment with the natural earth. That's reviving her spirits now, Cyprus said to Oversall Seven, Proteus in the third in the twenty third century is erecting his living nodule at the same time that Lydia and Lawrence hook up their small tent to the camper. In the twentieth century, do you understand? There are points of association brought into activity. Seven blinked. This conversation with Cyprus had obviously been going on for some time and he had only now become aware of it. Of course, it's obvious, he said, desperately trying to cover up. <laughs> but you so often overlook the details, Cyprus said. When you help one personality, you help all the others. Unconsciously, each feels the effects. For that matter, each personality 
helps the other. And when you're in contact with one, you're also in communication with each of them. But who helps me? Seven said. Pen Seven asked petulantly. I've been pelted around like a volleyball. A most apt earth description, Cypress said, smiling. But what makes you think you haven't been helped? How long have we been talking like this? Seven asked, ignoring the question. In whose terms? In any terms, Seven said. You're just dancing rings around me, and you think it's funny. Maha and Lydia are in real trouble, and maybe Proteus, who knows? And I get stuck inside Maha, just trapped there, except for now, and only let out when somebody needs me. It's not at all fair, examination or not. You make your own reality, Cyprus reminded him gently. We all do. Each consciousness does. So, dear Seven, try to remember what you've forgotten, or better still, just take it for granted that you really know what you're doing and go on from there. Take what for granted, Seven asked. There you go again. Your predicament. Maha's in a predicament. And Lydia and Proteus. I'm not, except for the ridiculous exam. Cyprus could no longer contain her amusement. She sighed. Oh, Seven, you'll have to go back to Maha for a while. Outside of your present context of operations, I'm sure you'll agree with me. You still don't understand. But I want to know what's happening to Joseph, Seven objected, and I don't want to go back inside, Maha. You have no idea how terribly confining that is, and I keep getting lost in her till I think I will never get out. Couldn't we take a break? A recess? And look in on Joseph. Oversoul Seven had adapted the 14-year-old image again. He found it most effective in dealing with Cyprus. She smiled and said, All right, but remember, this is to be a very brief vacation. Think of Joseph's painting. The landscape of the farm and grounds was on the easel. Joseph was in the process of applying a series of transparent glazes to it. Bianca, the 18-year-old Hassentoff daughter, sat on the messed bed watching. As he saw her, Seven moaned. Joseph was obviously showing off, standing with strong thighs apart, leaning backward, staring at the painting with his heavy brows lowered dramatically, and very conscious of Bianca's admiring glances. You better get out of here, he said. If anyone catches you in my room, I'll be thrown out on my ear or ass. She blushed, stood up, and wiggled over to him teasingly. She still hadn't retired her bodice so that looking down, Joseph saw her bare breasts. She grinned shamelessly, he thought, flipped one breast out of the bodice at him, and ran laughing about the room. They'll hear you. Shush. Hush. Shut up, he yelled. They aren't home yet, and you know it. Worried? She giggled breathlessly, her brown eyes alight with excitement. Well, your youngest brother is. You can't bribe him to leave us alone forever. What if he tells? La, la, that's your concern, she laughed. I'll just lie about the whole thing. Well, so will I, so will I, he shouted. He never knew how to handle her when she got in this kind of mood, and she knew it. Ah, the hell with it, he yelled hopelessly. He grabbed her, threw her on the bed, and grinned while she ripped his clothes off again. Seven was very quiet. He and Cyprus had merged with the landscape painting, peering through it, out into the room. Well... He's certainly having a good time, Seven said finally. I thought that's what, why you liked him so much, because he did enjoy himself, Cypress answered. Well, he is, isn't he? There's something in all of this that I don't like, Seven said doubtfully. In the meantime, 
he and Cyprus discreetly blocked out the scene. In the meantime, he and Cyprus discreetly blocked out the scene, so as not to invade Joseph's privacy in such a personal moment. They simply stayed in the landscape while putting a mental shield between themselves and the room. When Seven peeked back out, peeked back out, the girl was gone. A, dishe a disheveled Joseph sat unhappily on the bed, muttering to himself. He'd lost most of the good daylight painting hours, and now he was so disgusted with himself that he didn't feel like working. And if he didn't work, he'd just feel worse. He would just feel worse. More, as he eyed the painting, he had the uneasy, sus uneasy suspicion that something was wrong. For one thing, the glazes didn't look nearly as clear and glowing as they could. There was a suggestion of murkiness creeping into the color. He went over to the easel and stood glowering at the painting. Three days ago, the painting had looked great to him. This morning, it had looked great. Now he had projected all of his dissatisfaction with himself into the landscape. Flaws he hadn't noticed earlier became readily apparent. Had he grayed those colors down too much? Had he put on the top glaze before the one beneath was dry? Or was the problem in the dry pigment itself as he mixed it with the oil? He almost snarled. The thing was ruined, ruined beyond, pe beyond repair. His great inspiration, the best in his life, and he'd messed it up. To hell with it. He'd never be a good painter. To hell with Bianca and her damned family and the three lousy meals a day they gave him. He even had to eat with the farm hands. It was Bianca's fault for tempting him to begin with, keeping his mind from his work. In a rage, he shouted and kicked the bedside chair across the room. Then, to Oversoul Seven's utter disbelief, he grabbed the landscape and sent it flying to the floor with sudden fury. At first, Seven thought that the landscape had come to life in some mysterious fashion. What he saw before him was a landscape, but different, a three-dimensional one that stretched all around him. He looked around, trying to get his bearings. Cyprus and Joseph were gone. He was Maha again. She stood, gripping Rapa's hand. Before them were acres of green trees and flowering bushes, such as they had never seen before. The entire area was ringed by immense sheer cliffs, obviously impossible to climb. They were in a secret valley. A group of robed people stood in a circle on a small grassy knoll, and Maha and Rapa were being led toward them. Seven felt himself falling headlong into Maha's experience, yet oddly enough, descending into the body almost seemed like coming home. That's the end of chapter five. I will continue with chapter six next time. Thank you for listening. Ciao.